name is Kate, and I'm glad to be here to see you all today. We're going to have a little walk down the day in the life of a marine biologist. I don't know how many budding marine biologists are there out there. Raise your hands. You're not sure? <laughs> oh, look, I got one, Katie. All right. Well, maybe after this talk, you might think, oh, I might want to be a marine biologist. So I'll just give you a little background. I've been doing this kind of work for about 40 years. Yeah, I'm pretty old. Sorry, but I don't think I'm a dinosaur yet. And I'm going to tell you the story about how I decided and wanted to be a marine biologist. You're probably going to think, oh, she made this up for the talk, but I, I really didn't. So when I was eight years old, I told my father, I want to be a marine biologist. Well, I don't really even think I knew what a marine biologist was. And my father said, do you even know what a marine biologist is? And I said, I don't know, dad, but every week we watch these things on TV, the undersea world of Jacques Cousteau. Now you guys are all very young, so you probably never heard of it. But after the talk, get on Google and check it out because Jacques Cousteau was this really terrific marine biologist and he wore these slick wetsuits and they had undersea subs and they'd go to the bottom of the ocean and they'd bring some animals up for us to look at and they had this giant ship, the Calypso, with a heliport on it. It was so cool. And so that was the first thing for me. And I said, yeah, I want to be a marine biologist like Jacques Cousteau. Well, did I know that Jacques Cousteau was the marine biologist of the time and that it might not be that easy to become that type of marine biologist? Well, I didn't care. I tried anyways. Uh, we had a house at the shore and I lived in the garage apartment in my grandparents' house. And every day I'd go to the ocean across the street and I'd collect little animals, crabs and sane for killifish, you know, just the usual things. And I'd bring them back to my aquarium and I would try to make a drawing of them if I could. And then my father said, well, you better go to the library and check out what these things are about. And we, I didn't have internet then, but I had the library. And it looks like today, you guys still have the library even with internet, and that's really terrific. So, all right, we're gonna go on an aquatic journey, and I hope you see some cool things. And if you have any questions, put them in the chat. And at the end of it, we can all see how you felt about the talk. I'm looking forward to it, and I hope you are too. All right, Katie, you want to share? Yep, you should be able to hit share screen now. Here we go. Now I have a basic and advanced, and I got to go to share with my desktop. And what is this? Hold on. Let me get all this stuff off. Guys. It's kind of small. Why is it small? Any idea about that? Um, no, but oh, oh, I can see your screen. All right, so I want to open my talk, right? Mm -hmm. And we're going to play. Hang on a second, guys. Zoom and me were not that proficient yet. Doing good. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, you guys ready? Yeah. I've been, as I told you, I've been doing this for a really long time. And I worked at the aquarium in New York in Coney Island. And I've worked with, you know, lots of different animals. And when you work in marine biology, you have to first learn about regular biology and chemistry in order to be able to specialize afterwards for marine animals. So like a typical day at the aquarium, you know, we would be doing stuff that's called aquatic health. And at the aquarium, uh, we had a 14,000 square foot animal hospital. And that animal hospital could take care of a bunch of critters and we could do all sorts of things on them, just like you would do, you know, with your vet. It's amazing the kind of activities you can do with aquatic animals now. So this is a picture of me taking an x-ray with a wolf eel and we wanted to make find out whether she was pregnant. So we were doing a little bit of an exam on her. 
And that hospital was built so we could do a bunch of creatures, you know, things small like a seahorse, big as whales and walrus and dolphins. So you could imagine what kind of building it had to be to actually do that. Really special pools and special tables and special cranes to move the animals when we needed to do it. So every day would be kind of a different day at the aquarium. You know, maybe one day we might be working with something really small, like that seahorse up in the top left. The seahorse weighs only like maybe 10 grams, which is, you know, like a third of an ounce. So when you had to do something with a seahorse, you'd have to actually do it under the microscope because you wouldn't be able to see what you were doing. So other days we would have to do some work with fish and fish are kind of special because they have to breathe through their water, not like us, we use the air to breathe. So when a fish had to have something done on it, we would put it to sleep with anesthesia passed over its gills. So you'll see that fish up there in the top right, it's called the drum fish. We've got a lot of background, what is that? Is that me? Okay, maybe it's not. So the drum fish that you see is um, called the drum because it has a series of sound making vocal cords. And when it's underwater and it makes that sound, it actually sounds like a drum. It's so cool. It's an amazing thing to, to hear. So again, um, we work with turtles. Right, and sometimes a turtle will come in from the wild. I'm trying to figure out what that noise is, Kate. Can everyone, anyone that's not muted, can you just make sure you're muted? I want to just make sure you guys can hear me. Yeah, perfect. Thank you. All right. So um, sometimes we would get a turtle that would come in from the bay, you know, and maybe the turtle had gotten hit by a boat. And if it got hit by the boat, then we'd bring it into the aquarium. We'd assess what its shell looked like. If the shell was cracked, we'd repair it. As I said, we, had, we have really big tables and really big x-ray machines. So we, we can do a lot of health exams for many, many different kinds of animals. The sea lion that you see over on the left, I don't know if any of you have big dogs, but if you have big dogs, you know that it's pretty good to have them trained right, because if they're not trained so well, you know, they could be out of control and you're not going to get them to do anything. Instead of you walking the dog, the dog's going to walk you. Well, imagine if the sea lion, who's much bigger than a big dog, was walking the trainer, we'd be in pretty big trouble in the aquarium. So in this picture, the trainer hat is using her hand as what's called a target. And the hand uh, is put wherever the, they want the sea lion to stop and do something. So in this case, she's asking the sea lion, put your nose right here on my hand so you can turn your eye a certain way in case the vet needs to take a look at your eye, right? So that way we can work with big animals and we don't have to worry that um, they are getting stressed, you know, by us restraining them or anything. So we do that each day too. Okay, remember I told you about that sea turtle. The sea turtle came in and not only did it have a cracked shell, it also had something in its stomach. It had swallowed some fish and the fish had hooks in it. And so if we had left the fish with the hooks in it, then the, sea, then the sea turtle would not have done well. So you can see the picture of the team here. They're using what's called an endoscope that gets put down the sea turtle's throat and it can look into the actual stomach and find whatever it is you're looking for. And if you find the hook, then it's got a little tweezer on the end of it and you can use the tweezer to take that hook back out. Pretty cool, right? All right, so we're, we're uh, working with a bunch of different animals. You know, we work with sharks and dolphins and whales and harbor seals and wolf eels and sea lions. 
But not only do we do those things, we also have to make sure that the water is good. If any of you have aquariums, you know that the most important thing in your aquarium is the water. So every day at the aquarium, somebody would have to go out and test all the water to make sure the water was perfect. And if the water isn't perfect, then you know we have to do something to correct it. We are kind of lucky in Coney Island because our water comes from right from the ocean. We have a big pipe that goes way out into the ocean and we can bring clean water in any day and filter it and change the water whenever we want. So it, in aquatic health at the hospital, we have technicians that are able to do blood samples and able to identify parasites. They know how to read x-rays. They know how to do ultrasounds. You know, we do a lot of different jobs. All right. So that's what we do at the aquarium in the hospital. Sometimes we have to, do I have to admit someone? Yes, I'm the host. Oh God, that's terrible. Sorry, hold on. What happened, Katie? Um, go up to the top where it says, um, does it say stop sharing? It's, it's, uh, it's red. You are screen sharing, it says. It's okay. asked about John Barton and entering the waiting room. Oh, okay. It's asking me to admit him and I can't get my cursor to do that. Let me, let me try to, oh, there we go. Good. I don't know how to admit John. That's to okay. You. you can, you can leave it, but we're, I, we can see your screen again. Okay, good. All right. So some days we have to move some big animals like whales and walruses. And some days we move, might move them in the aquarium, you know, like if their pool needed to be fixed or something. And other times we might move them to another aquarium, say to meet new friends or to do breeding programs, you know. So when you move animals like a whale, you have to be super careful because they weigh a lot. And because they weigh a lot, when they're out of the water, you can put some stress on their organs, you know, and you don't want to do that. So the first thing we do when we move the whale is we lower the pool level so the people can get in and they can get access to the whale. And then we lower that white piece of material that you see in the pool. That's called the stretcher. We lower that in and we straighten it out and we got to get it so it's even and not wrinkled because we don't want the whale to be uncomfortable. So here we are actually moving the whale. This is a beluga whale. We're moving it to position it properly in the stretcher. And again, as I said, we get rid of all the wrinkles. We make sure that we didn't bring any gravel in on our wetsuit booties, because if we did and that gravel got in there, geez, it'd kind of be like, imagine if you had your shoe and you got a piece of pebble in it, but you couldn't get the pebble out for hours. It'd be so uncomfortable. Aside from the fact whales don't have hands, so it'd be kind of hard for them to get it out. Okay, then the next thing we do, we take the stretcher and we raise it up from the pool and now we make it level and then we close it up because we don't want the whale falling out of the back of the stretcher when we're lifting it with the crane, that would be kind of bad. And this is, you know, the start of the whale flying over the rail of the pool. And this is just an overview. So I just wanted to show you that it takes a lot of people to catch the whale to start. And then there's different size stretchers that you use. And then this is the whale actually flying. And in Coney Island, we have a bunch of um, apartment buildings across the street from us. And so whenever we would move the whales, the people from the apartment buildings would go to their balconies with their binoculars to watch us. I think that's kind of cooler than probably looking for birds. All right, sometimes we would take the whales on a road trip to meet friends. And when we did that and they were going uh, over transport by truck, in the truck, there were these big boxes that are lined with like a pool liner that has water in it. 
And just like when we set the stretcher in the pool, it's important to set it right in the truck because the whale's going to be a lot of hours before it gets out, you know, out of the box and into its new pool. So when we get it into the box, the box has just enough water to float the whale because whales don't really like to be out of water. They have to really be supported in water and floating because they're so heavy, it would put too much pressure on their internal organs if they were to lay on the ground without it. Then we open the stretcher and give them a little bit of room, you know, so they can feel comfortable during the transport. And these pictures are pictures of our female belugas getting ready to go to the mystic aquarium so they could meet some new whales from Russia. All right, so that's how we move whales in the aquarium. Now this is gonna be some historic footage and early on we collected whales from the wild we don't do that any longer. We haven't done that for decades because now whales and walrus are able to be bred in captivity and we exchange them with other places across the country and internationally in Europe so we can keep an active population of marine mammals should we need them if something were to happen to them in the wild. So I was lucky and I got to go on a collecting trip a couple of times. Uh, and to collect the beluga whales, I went to a place called Churchill, and it's in Hudson's Bay, Canada, and that's way up by the Arctic Circle. So I don't know if you guys know belugas, but beluga whales are kind of social. They're smaller whales, and they come to this area of uh, the Hudson's Bay in the summertime in groups of like, you know, 10 to 20,000. They come to breed and they come to have calves. And this place is really nice and conducive for them to do those things. And it's kind of shallow water. Now, beluga whales, not only called the white whale, but they're also called the canary of the sea. And they're called the canary of the sea because they make these sounds that's, that's like singing and they do that so they can talk to each other. And listen to this. Can you hear it? This is the beluga singing. We don't know what it's saying, but I think its friends know what it's saying. And they can make high pitch vocalizations as you see. They kind of smile when they do it too. They're cute belugas. So I'm going to show you a, a video, a short video of the collection of one of our beluga whales. Her name is Marina. This was a collection in 1985 and 1987. And I want to tell you that when we went to Churchill, we worked with a group of Native Americans called Inuits. They're from a tribe of Native American Indians, and they'd been hunting whales for centuries. But, you know, life changes and things get uh, more advanced, and even tribes like that no longer have to hunt whales. So in the 70s, they decided, okay, we're out of the hunting business to get whales for food and resources. Maybe now we could help some aquariums that want to collect belugas in the late 70s and the early 80s. And we know special techniques that are kind to the animals and we can help them. So I'm going to show you this picture, uh, excuse me, a little video, and it's of a really nice sunny day in July. You might think it was 80, but... It's probably closer to 30 in July. And I don't know if you know, when you're up by the Arctic Circle in July and August, the sun is out for almost 24 hours. It only goes in at like three o'clock in the morning and then it comes back again at like five. So if you wanted to stay up for days and days, you could. Here we go now.
were out on the water of Hudson's Bay, Canada. We're using small aluminum motor boats to herd the whales into shallow water and single out a whale we want to try for. The Inuit bowman has a suede wrapped lasso that he slides around the head of the whale as the boat pulls up to it. He yells, jump! And the cold water cowboys and cowgirls jump onto the top of the whale and the rodeo begins. The whale is held in waist deep water and is measured to make sure it's the right length and then it's sex to find out if it's a boy or a girl. Then we bring a cushioned stretcher in from the mother canoe, a giant canoe that will bring the whale back to shore. The vet takes a blood sample before the whale is put in the canoe, and then we drive off back to the Beluga Hotel, where there's a pool there, but it's for the whales, not the people. Now we do 24-hour watches over the whales. We take blood samples to make sure everything is okay, and we even go to the people hospital in town to analyze the samples. If a whale had a blood sample that isn't just right, the whale will get released back into the bay and we'll try again for another whale. The whale that gets released will get caught back up in the stretcher in the pool. Then we lift it with the crane again, bring it down to the beach where we have to manually take it out of the stretcher and we'll watch it carefully as it goes back out through the inlet to make sure that there's no problem with it. Now the other whales have been acclimated and they're ready to go to the United States. The whales are in cushion boxes and they're slathered with zinc oxide, just like you might use on the beach. It keeps them moist and someone will wet them down periodically during the trip to keep them comfortable. The plane is kept at 45 to 50 degrees, comfortable for the whale, but re requiring a parker for the rest of us. After the plane lands in New York, the final leg is on a truck to Coney Island before they're placed in their pool after a day and a half of travel. Our marina came to New York to be a part of a pod of five other whales that want to have seven babies collectively and become genuine marine mammal ambassadors. The pool is at a low water level so they can get used to their new space and their new people. Now here she is being re reunited with her other whale friends from Canada. Okay, pretty cool, right? Uh, uh, I got to admit Joe in order to continue. Okay. Okay. You stop my screen and go on. All right. So here's Marina captivating millions of people for years and years and years at the aquarium. They have cute smiles, don't they? Okay. So just like the whales, sometimes we'd have to rescue baby walruses. In Alaska, you wouldn't believe that sometimes the mother walruses get separated from their babies, maybe by an ice flow or, you know, just a, a bunch of things. And once they get separated, if the baby is brand new, it needs to have the mom right away because they have to drink milk right away. So when there'd be baby orphan baby walrus, we'd get a call by Fish and Wildlife to come to Alaska to try to get them started on the bottle, then bring them to New York, and then raise them until they could get to the point where they could be eating fish and do normal things. So the first thing you do when you're raising a baby walrus is you got to get it so it um, feels comfortable with you. You know, it doesn't have its mom and it, it wants to have touch and it wants to feel comfortable with whoever's in the enclosure with it because we have to teach it to feed from a bottle. And in order to teach it to feed from a bottle, they have to really trust us. So originally on when the baby's really young, 
they eat, take from the bottle that's like a typical human baby bottle. But as they grow older, they'll eventually take from what's like a calf bottle and you'll see a picture of that later. So we, we work with the baby walrus round the clock when they come in in a situation like this. They have to be fed every four hours. They're gonna eat between one to two gallons of formula a day. They're gonna um, need to gain between one and two pounds a day because that's the normal track for them to do. And uh, we have to weigh them to make sure that they're doing that. So we put them on a little uh, dog crate, the top of a dog crate. And then every other day we put them on this scale and we'd, we'd measure to make sure that they were growing the way they're supposed to. And if they weren't growing the way they're supposed to, we'd either add feed or take feed away if they were growing too fast. And they really, walruses love people. It's amazing how social they are. They wanna be near you, not just as a baby, when you've raised them, from a baby to be an adult walrus, they really know you. They know your voice. They certainly know you when you come up to them and they're really quite social animals. They like to have an interaction with people. This is a close up of Kulu, who later on you're gonna see, we raised her from a baby from the wild. You're gonna see her have her own baby many years later. And we've taken probably three walruses that have been stranded from Alaska. And this is a small video of uh, Middick. In the video, you're gonna see that he's um, kind of rambunctious. So here he is, just peeking over his pool. And they're pretty um, limber. They can, they can definitely get around. And remember I told you they used to take the baby bottle? Well, he's old enough now to take that giant bottle and he's gonna drink between six and eight of those a day, which is crazy when you think about it. And he likes his trainer. You can see that's Martha there. She has a good rapport with him. And they, do, they spend a lot of time together. She makes toys for him to keep him occupied because Baby walrus like to get in trouble. You know, they're they've got they got a lot of energy and they need to be keep doc, they need to be kept occupied and stimulated, or they could make a mess somewhere. But the main thing that they want is they want to hang out with whoever their mother is, their new mother. They they'll suck your thumb, they want to spend time on your lap, they just want to have a lot of touch and comfort. Okay, so moving on, this might be a little hard, so you gotta focus here, right? The belugas had babies in captivity and the, bel the beluga whales you're gonna see are some of the ones that we collected from the wild. In this first video, there's two adult whales in the pool and there's the, the mom whale. The other adult whale, we call her an ant whale. Her name's Kathy. Can you see the baby there? If you look to the right, you see the tail of the baby coming from mom. And the ant whale, Kathy, she's being very attentive. She's in the pool with Natasha because she's had a baby before and she's gonna help Natasha in case she's not quite sure what to do. Because the most important thing, there's the baby. If you look at the top of the screen, I know it's dark. The first thing the baby does is go to the surface of the water to breathe. And here he comes, our little Hudson. He's coming around and the two uh, female whales are gonna sort of take him in between that. So he the pool's about, and then he's gonna learn who mom is. When he comes around on this side, you're gonna see, he knows he's with mom. He puts his little pectoral fin right on his mother's back there. So he's like, oh, you're my mom. Okay, great. And it's pretty amazing to get to see baby belugas being born because we don't really do anything. 
the whales do everything. And if the whales know what they're doing, then there's never any problem. The mom will take care of the baby on its own and the babies grow up to be strong and happy and healthy. Okay. This one might be a little bit better. And the only reason I was showing you a second one is because this is Marina. Remember, I showed you that video of Marina coming from the wild. This is Marina, who's going to have her first baby. And some people might say, well, how is she going to know how to have a baby? You took, she came from the wild before she didn't know anything about that. This is what it's about, kids. Animals, including human animals, they know from the start what needs to happen. So here comes Marina and they always do a gentle little dance. Here's the baby's tail. The one thing I wanted to say to you is the baby whales are between 150 and 180 pounds when they're born. They're about four feet long too. Isn't that crazy? And they have, they come out tail first and they have to come out tail first because they got to breathe. It's the first thing they do. And if they came out head first and they opened their mouth underwater, that would kind of be bad. There she goes, right up. Her name is Aurora. She, first thing she did, right up to the surface to make sure she could get her first breath. And Marina turns around and here she is coming to the camera for us to see her. That's our baby Aurora. All right, you met Kulu earlier feeding from the bottle. Now it's seven years later, she's gonna have her own baby now too. And if you look on the bottom of the screen and you look to the left, you're gonna see the little head of the walrus on the left. The big walrus is the mommy. The little head on the left by the mommy's butt is the is the baby wars. You have to look closely and carefully because you can't believe the baby walrus and how fast it can be born. She does a little twirl, just like the whales do in the water. When she comes back around, keep looking to the left. There's the head of the baby. Now, Aki, that's gonna be his name. There he goes. Oh, look at that. A beautiful brand new baby walrus. Now, Kulu, remember her? She came from the wild as an orphan. And again, people would think, how is Kulu gonna know how to take care of a baby? Who's, who taught her that, right? We didn't teach her that. She knew it right out. Look at the pictures of her here with her, her baby Aki. She taught him everything. She taught him how to nurse. She taught him how to swim. She taught him how to get fish when the time came for fish. Marine mammals are pretty incredible. All right, so we don't always work in the aquarium. Sometimes we work out in the field. Sometimes we do a conservation work. And if you're familiar and you know what the term conservation means, it means sometimes there's some species in the wild that aren't doing good and we have to go out and study them. And we have to try to figure out what we can do, what's wrong first, then we try to figure out what we can do. So we go wherever there's a need for it. And in this case, we went to Belize. And so we were collecting these turtles from under the water, hawksbill turtles they are, and the divers go down and they find the turtle on the bottom. And then they basically let the turtle ride them up to the surface, which is pretty crazy because they weigh like a hundred pounds. And we do this with research scientists in the field. And we also do it with volunteers. On this trip, the volunteers were from Google, you know, Google the search engine. So the people from Google thought, wow, you guys have really cool jobs. I mean, it's amazing the things you do. And we thought, wow, you guys have really cool jobs because we got to meet the people from Google that are the people that actually design the Google Doodle every day. I kind of thought that was cool. And so after the trip, they of course made a Google Doodle that was all about uh, conservation of hawksbills turtles in Belize. We're gonna listen for a second how excited these volunteers are. And you guys could be volunteers. If you get to work for a big company, if you don't wanna be a marine biologist, Google and all the big companies love their employees to go out and do volunteer work. Maybe someday you'll do this. 
Oh, hold it. Oh, you trying to see that one or... Yeah, taking a selfie. Pretty cool, right? So then the turtle comes up on the boat. It gets me uh, measured, weighed. It gets a blood sample taken, a whole bunch of data points. Sometimes we take big ones like the giant loggerheads. One or two of them might get selected to come back to the field station. And when they come back there in these pictures, we're putting on a little bit of a radio transmitter. We're gluing that onto the shell. Then when the turtle gets released, that radio transmitter will tell us stuff like how deep does it dive? What's the temperature of the water where it is? Where did it go? How long does it spend on the surface? And that data is really important because if a species is in trouble and we can find out the area that they like to use, then maybe we can try to petition governments to make like a marine sanctuary so we can sort of help them to survive. Okay, conservation's hard guys. It mostly doesn't work so well because it takes a lot of people, takes a lot of effort. Usually when you're going to try to save a species, it's kind of too far along, but we've had two really good ones and I'm gonna show you one of them. The Grand Cayman Iguana, okay? It's called the Grand Cayman Blue Iguana because first it's only found in Grand Cayman. And I know you're probably thinking, what is she talking about? There's so many iguanas. Why? What, what's with this one being in danger? It can't be. Well, those iguanas that you might have heard about and know, those iguanas in Florida and all over, they're the Cuban iguana. It's a different iguana from this one. And that Cuban iguana is not meant to be in the United States. Some people kept iguanas as pets. And then when they got too big in Florida, they just released them out into the wild. And the Cuban iguana can just, you know, breed really big time and they outcompete any other iguanas. So this is different from that iguana. And it's called the Grand Cayman iguana, blue iguana because first I told you from Grand Cayman, second, because it's a really beautiful blue when it's heated up after it's been basking in the sun. So we started with a bunch of other conservationists, a program in Grand Cayman to take the remaining species from the wild, we call them founder stock, and bring them into a captive breeding facility in Grand Cayman and then hatch the eggs, okay? And so we hatch the eggs and we make different age groups of iguanas. And then each year when the age group of the iguana got old enough, they were gonna be released into a protected area on Grand Cayman. So we would come, every year and we take blood samples and do a bunch of other health things to make sure that the iguanas couldn't bring anything out to the wild that could hurt the, the remaining animals in the wild, which were not that many. So this is a, a juvenile and he's having a chip implanted. Maybe you guys have dogs and your dogs might have a chip for identification if they were to get lost. Well, the iguana gets a chip too. And the iguana also gets beads. They have beads that are put on its crest behind its neck. And they're different colors and different sizes. So when the field biologist goes out into the field, they can look through their binoculars and see what color the beads are. And then they can know, oh, that's an iguana that we released five years ago. Wow, terrific, still doing well, right? Now, I have to say, I have a cool job, but one of the coolest things ever is to be able to release an endangered species back into the wild. This is a little juvenile iguana going into what's called a retreat. And that's so he'll have safety in the daytime. There he goes, raised in captivity and now repopulating to a protected area in Grand Cayman in the wild. In 2000, there were only 16 
Grand Cayman Iguanas. That's crazy. That's endangered. That's on the highest of the endangered list. And in 2019, because of this program, now there's a thousand. So we're on our way to hopefully making sure that the blue iguana, you know, doesn't have any more problems. Okay. What else do I do? Sometimes we're called to rescue some marine mammals that strand, you know, at home sometimes, and sometimes around the globe, halfway around the world. So in 2008, there was a really significant stranding event in Madagascar. Yeah, that Madagascar. I didn't see those guys though. I don't know where Alex was, you know, and Merv and Skip, but Anyway, I went and I was at the mangrove area part, not the rainforest where those guys are. And we brought an entire team with us and it took us 24 hours to get there. And remember what I said earlier, whales do not like to be out of the water long. So when they're out of the water beach long, their chances for survival are a lot worse. So we rushed to get to a place and because we're going to a place that doesn't have the resources that we have, we have to try to remember to bring everything with us. We used a series of boats to try to herd the whales into smaller groups in order to try to get them out of the mangrove area and back to the ocean. It was not as easy as everyone thought it was going to be. So 150 melon headed whales stranded during this event. And this was so unusual because in Madagascar, they never had anything like that before. And the government was so upset about it because they, you know, they didn't understand what was going on. That's why they called for an international team to come and help. Melon-headed whales like to be in pods. And if somebody in their pod gets sick, or something happens, they get disoriented or something, then all the other ones follow it. The other ones might not be sick, but they're gonna follow that one because you know that's what they do, they stick together. Now, the people of Madagascar, they, they fish a lot and they, they feel that their animals there, their big animals, whales and dolphins, are kind of like spiritual animals for them, that they're lucky and that they protect them and that they help them find their food. And so when the whales were turning up on the beach, they were so upset because they didn't, they didn't know what was happening. You know, they'd never seen anything like it before. And they were trying to do whatever they could to keep them comfortable until we could come and help them. The, here's a, a group of fishermen. The fishermen in particular spent all this time trying to get the whales off the beach and floating them in the, in the water because they knew that the whales were in big trouble the longer that they stayed on the beach. Now, Madagascar is a kind of pretty poor country, so they don't have a lot of resources. And it's not, you saw earlier in the talk, it's not easy to move big animals without having a lot of you know, resources like cranes and stuff. Yep. Okay, some of the whales were really far inland, like maybe 10 to 12 miles from the ocean. That's so far, you know, and they couldn't find their way back. So we had one boat that was a fast boat and we would take the whales, we'd, we'd put them up on the boat, We'd take the whales, keep them wet and moist, and we'd you know, take the boat and go all the way out to the ocean to bring them to safety, you know, because that was the only way we could do it. The herding you know, was just taking too long. It was too slow. The, the day that we did a lot of herding, it was, it was going so badly. We couldn't get any of the whales to go out. You know, we'd get them in a little ball, we'd start them moving forward, and then one would veer off to the side, the, all the rest of them would go with it, and then they'd go backwards. We were getting frustrated. So one of, the, one of our hosts from the Malagasy fishing tribe, he said, let's go see the chief at this village on a remote part of the river. 
maybe he can do a special ceremony for us to try to give us good luck so we can have better luck and save the whales. So, so we go to this village and we, you know, they do some dancing, they do some singing, chanting. He uh, burns some incense and we hung out there for a little bit. So then at the end of that, we had our digital cameras and we asked if we could take some pictures of the kids that were part of the ceremony and the chief said that we could. And when we took the pictures of the kids, none of us realized that none of the children had ever seen themselves before because they live in this remote place that doesn't have mirrors. And the only way that they can see themselves is sometimes when they go down to the side of the river, they can look in the water and see their reflection. But you know what that's like, you can't really see yourself. It's not, not like a mirror. So for the first time they saw themselves, we took this picture and we could show the image on the screen of the digital camera and the kids recognized themselves for the first time because they looked at the image on the camera and then they looked down at them and they looked at their shirt and then they looked at the image and they looked at their shirt and then they looked at their friend and they touched their friend because they could see that their friend's shirt was that color. It was pretty cool, right? It's kind of amazing when you go somewhere and you work with different cultures and you can share something with them that they might not know. So working in countries that have less than we do is always amazing and outstanding. You work with people that are nothing like you, but they can teach you a lot. And it makes you know that when you come home, oh man, we have so many more things than most other people in the world. All right, so that's a stranding in a foreign land. In New York, we had a very famous whale that was stranded in the Long Island Sound. And she was sick for a period of time, came to the aquarium, we got her better. And then we mounted this pretty big effort to release her back in the wild. And this is a little story of Wilhelmina. This is the story of Wilhelmina. Wilhelmina was a pilot whale that stranded in the Long Island Sound and was brought to the New York Aquarium. She was hanging around in Long Island for a really long time. She wasn't with any of her friends and pilot whales like to have friends. They like to be in groups. And she was in some shallow areas and it looked like she was having a hard time. So we worked with the Coast Guard and with the National Marine Fisheries Service to try to figure out if they'd let us bring her to the aquarium to find out if she was sick. So they let us do it. We brought her to the aquarium and she was with us for around nine months. And we did find out that she was sick. We were able to treat her and feed her and get her stronger and better. And all the while the goal was to be able to get her to go back out to the ocean one day. Millions of school kids in New York and New Jersey knew her. She was really a celebrity. Every day she was on the morning news shows and she was in the newspapers every day too. If it were today's day and age, she would have been a big time Twitter and Instagram and social media influencer. But she had to just make do with regular papers and TVs. So we worked with the Coast Guard and a bunch of other partners. We had a big box made for her out of metal with crane points so she could be lifted onto the Coast Guard cutter Sorel. This cutter normally would be taking a buoy out of the bay or the ocean and cleaning it up. But today, the Coast Guard cutter was designed to bring the whale out to the ocean so it could be released. We have a radio transmitter that's going to be placed onto her dorsal fin, which was gonna allow us to track her once she was released to the ocean. 
so we could try to figure out where she's going to be, how deep she dives, whether she's hunting for food, what the temperature of the ocean is. And the radio transmitter will last probably for around three or four months before the batteries go dead and then it falls off her. The radio transmitter told us that she hung around the New York and New Jersey area for several months before she started to make her way up towards the Massachusetts area. And knowing pilot whales and where they like to hang out, we thought that this was a great deal because maybe she was going to try to find some of her other friends. Well, we don't know for sure whether that happened or not because the transmitter ended up, you know, finally the battery went dead on it. But this was a really great success story for the New York Aquarium and our partners because strandings are really hard. Usually by the time a whale strands, it's really very difficult to find out what's wrong with it or the whale is just so sick you can't do anything to help it. But in Wilhelmina's case, we were able to get her before she stranded. We actually took her from the ocean in the Long Island Sound and brought her into the aquarium before she got really, really sick. So this is the story of Wilhelmina. Took a lot of people to get her better, took a lot of people to get her to go back to the ocean. And when you're a biologist and you work with big marine mammals like this, it's really a dream come true. It's not every day. You can tell your friends you were out on a Coast Guard boat releasing a whale off the East Coast of the United States that's just lived for nine months in a public aquarium and has been the toast of the town for that whole time, a real genuine celebrity. There she Okay, guys, so now we're coming to the end. Hopefully you weren't bored. Now there's a thing called citizen science. I don't know if you guys know it. I don't know whether you guys participate in it or not, but there's lots of different kinds of citizen science. Sometimes Audubon asks people to do a bird camp. Uh, sometimes there's other organizations like Nat Geo that ask citizen scientists to go somewhere and help them collect data. In New York and New Jersey, we have a place called, we have an organization called Gotham Whale. And what Gotham Whale does, we're, um, we're trying to collect data points for the whales that are currently living around us. I don't know if you know how many whales there are out there, but if you go on the boardwalk, or if you go on your beaches and at certain times of the year and you make you look out into the ocean, you can see humpback whales. And if you do see a humpback whale, you could you could fill out the most wanted poster. And all that would be is if you have your camera, you can take a picture of it, you record down the location where you saw it, and then you send it into Gotham Whale. And then Gotham Whale has what's called a, the whale catalog, okay? So we're making a catalog of whales for New York and New Jersey. And a lot of those data points that you see are from everyday Joes who go out onto their beaches or they go out on a whale watching trip and they help us to collect the data, okay? Now, whales, especially humpbacks, have... Um, very distinctive tails. And the pattern on their tails is, everyone is unique, kind of like a person's fingerprint, like nobody's fingerprint, no two fingerprints are the same, no two whale tails are the same. So if we can get a picture of the whale's tail and we can match it in the catalog, then we know whether that whale's been here before and we know it or whether it's a new whale to add to the catalog. So you're probably asking, well, what are we doing this for, right? Okay, well, we're doing this because 
more than ever, we have a lot of whales here. And this is a kind of a busy place. So we like to know where the whales are in case you know there's some issues with pollution or ships or things like that. In this picture, you'll see the, the small fish called the menhaden. The menhaden are the real reason why we have so many whales here now. Now more than ever, we have more menhaden. And because we have more food for the whales to eat, we have more whales. In this picture, the whale's coming up from the bottom of the ocean with its mouth open. And what it's done right before that, it's blown some bubbles in a circle. And the bubbles in the circle confuse the fish. And when the fish get confused, they go into a big ball and they school and they go up the column of the water. But underneath the column of the water is that whale with its big mouth. And so he comes up through the water and opens his wide mouth and gets as many of those fish as he can to feed. And you can imagine how many fish it must take to feed a 20,000 pound whale, but they do it. Another reason why we want to know where the whales are is because we have really big ships here, okay? And if the whales are in the same place where the really big ships are, it can kind of be dangerous. You know, they could get hit by a ship, you know, it could be a problem. So if we know where the whales are and where they like to hang around, we could ask policymakers and state and federal government to try to help us make rules and regulations to protect the whales. Sometimes whales do things called spy hopping. A lot of people think it's uh, a feeding uh, technique. Some people think it's because they might have some small parasites and they want to jump them off by getting out of the water. And other people think they might just do it for fun. You know, I think that they do it to thank us for all the work that we're doing for them. So if you're out, and about in the summertime and you wanna see whales and you don't wanna be a citizen scientist, although I encourage you to do that, you can just go on a whale trip out of the Rockaway Bay on the American Princess and see whales all the time during the season. It's really cool and you'd be amazed. Most people think that we don't have whales here, but we have whales, man, they're out there. All right. So that was a day in the office, my office. I hope you saw some pretty cool things. I hope you were interested in it. If you think you wanna think about doing biology or marine biology, maybe this will give you some idea of the kinds of things that are out there and available for you. And maybe in 30 years, you'll be giving a talk to some young people that might want to continue the work, help save our oceans, help save our species from extinction. It's a great job. You get to meet lots of different people all around the world. And most days, it's really super fun. Thanks for listening. Thanks so much, Kate. Thank you so much. That was amazing. Terrific. Um, if you um, have time, we have time for just a couple of questions. Um, if somebody, if anybody wants to throw a question in the chat, um, please do so now. Um, I have a question. Um, what, um, what kind of education do you need to become a marine biologist? Okay, good question, Katie. You can be a marine biologist with your bachelor's of science in like a straight marine bio but it's probably better to get not only your bachelor's of science, which you could get in biology or marine biology, and then go on to get a master's so you could specialize a little more. Mm -hmm. If you want to do strict research, you know, real peer reviewed paper publishing research, then you probably should get your PhD, but you don't need it, right? So for me, my background is I have a BS in marine biology, then when I uh, finally figured out wanted, what I wanted to specialize in, I got what was called a certified fisheries pathologist uh, science degree on top of it, because I was very interested in fish disease and diagnosis and treatments. 
And you don't have to just, if you wanna be in aquatic science, you don't just have to be a marine biologist. You could be an aquatic vet. If you don't wanna take so much schooling, you could be a licensed veterinary technician that works with aquatic animals. That's a two or a four year specialized degree and then a sit for your licensing test. I mean, there's a lot of jobs that are available in aquatic science. Um, one of the um, participants, they wanna know how much a beluga whale weighs. How much do they weigh? Okay, when the baby whale's born, it weighs between 150 and 180 pounds. The adult male belugas uh, they, they come in at about 3,000 pounds, but nothing, nothing like an adult walrus. The adult male walrus comes in at about 5,500 pounds. Wow. <laughs> That's a very large puppy. Yeah. That walrus. <laughs> um, here's another question. What was your favorite adventure um, with trying to get a marine animal to help them? Well, uh, you saw the, you know, it's kind of hard to say what my favorite is because I've, you know, had a lot and I've just picked and choose some cherry ones for you today. But I have to say that for me, going to Madagascar to help with the stranding of the melon headed whales was one of my most special trips. First, because it was so challenging for us because we're not used to working with so few things. And secondly, because it was so heartfelt to work with the culture of the Malagasy people who were genuinely so concerned about these animals and wanted to do and help us in whatever way they could help us to help the animals. And the third thing about that stranding is it's so important in the history of marine mammal strandings because I, I don't know if you've, anyone's ever heard the term, it's called uh, UME, an unexplained mortality event. And most marine mammal strandings are just that. We never find out why they strand, but this one was unique in the fact that we found out that it was directly related with an oil and gas exploration event. And so it was so important, it was such important work. I think it was, you know, one of the highlights for me. Hmm. Um, one other question, um, one of the attendees came in a little bit late. She just wanted to know um, where you currently work um, and how did you come to work there? Okay, so I am now what's called an emeritus scientist for the Wildlife Conservation Society. So I'm retired from the New York Aquarium, but because I have emeritus status, they allow me to still go on my field conservation trips whenever they need someone with my expertise. Now I have my own business and my business is called The Fish Doctor and I do work uh, helping to diagnose fish disease and water quality issues. And I also design big aquariums for hospitals and doctors and dentist office and um, mostly consultant work now. Okay, um, last question. What's your favorite marine animal? Oh, easy, the octopus. <laughs> Why? So um, octopus are invertebrates. I hope everyone knows the difference between a vertebrate and an invertebrate. The invertebrates are spineless. They don't have a spine. Vertebrates are like us. They have spines. They're fish and dolphins and whales. Invertebrates are like lobsters and octopus. Okay. And the octopus is one of the coolest of all marine animals because they're so smart. And they, sometimes the ones that are the big giant Pacific octopus, they weigh maybe 25 or 30 pounds, but they can get through the opening of the top of a tank the size of a quarter. The only thing that keeps them from getting through a small opening is they have a beak, which is like the beak of a parrot that they use to crush certain crustaceans for food. And if you guys, 
like octopus like I do, there's a terrific film called My Octopus Teacher. And it will tell you all about octopus and why we should all love them just as much as I do. I've seen that. I haven't, I haven't watched it, but I've seen, it. I think it's on Netflix right it's, now. Yeah. It's, it's terrific. It's, you know, it's a specialty film, not for everybody, but if you love marine animals, you'll love this film. All right. Perfect. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate this. I, I found this super interesting. I hope everybody else did. Yeah, it was terrific. Did. All right. Well, really thanks true. everybody for attending. Um, keep an eye on our calendar. This is just a blatant plug for the rest of our programming. Um, we have a lot more coming up in the next month. And if everybody really liked the beluga whale um, conversation, we're having another program uh, on the 21st of April uh, with the Mystic Aquarium. They're gonna be um, talking about their beluga whales as well. So make sure to check that one out. Um, and I'm gonna again, make Kate. a plug. Yeah. Wait, I'm gonna make a plug, Kate. Yes. On the for, uh, I'm sorry, on the 7th of April, we have the sharks coming, uh, a shark program for the Baltimore Aquarium. Yes. So just wanted to plug that one. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you again, Kate. Thank you so much, everyone else, for attending. Thanks, Katie. Thank you. That Bye. was great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank I'd you. like to know, I, I'd like to tell you I know how to stop sharing the screen, but I don't. Oh, uh, that's all right. <laughs> I, I reclaimed the host, so I'm good. <laughs> okay, great.